Now, if Joe was home yesterday, he would have uh, been up here himself, but he wasn't there to receive the call, so Brother Earl called me. And for letting some know, some of you, we've known each other for some number of years. Others, uh, I haven't known there as long. And uh, the interesting thing is, is that Nancy and I were married right over there in the living room of the parsonage. And uh, I had to ask her because I went totally blank. Anybody remember the person that was there that married us? Kermit Johnson? Remember Kermit? Yeah, so that's who married us. Uh, Nancy and our two sons were baptized right here. So we've been around for a little while. You just probably hadn't seen us. And some of you were very young. I'm not speaking to anybody on that side of the room, but they were mostly babies, Robbie. So they all grew up, went to school. Our boys went to school with them. They uh, all graduated high school, and here we are now. We're somewhat uh, older in life, and things are picking up. So that's kind of the, where we've been with Washington Street. And a number of years ago, you know, I had a real heart-throbbing experience, and the heart-throbbing experience says, you know, Richard, you need to really move out from where you're at, and you need to do something different in your life. And what he said was, is the Lord said, Richard, I want you to go out and preach. And I said, there in any way that that's going to happen. In fact, Nancy, I was sitting at the kitchen table studying for a Sunday school lesson. And I told Nancy, I said, the Lord's called me to preach. And she said, there in any way that that's going to happen. Just forget it. Take it out of your mind. We're not going to talk about it. And we're not going to do anything. So, but here we are. And just to let you know, in our ministry, uh, we've been to Rocky Point since here. We've been to, I had a church in Breckenridge for a couple of years. Uh, I interimed at uh, Duffo Baptist Church for a while. And then uh, we're over at Pony Creek, helping them out a little bit. And uh, now Greens Creek has asked me uh, in considering whether they want me to be the interim there while they're finding. And my ministry is this. My ministry is to... Go to small churches, churches that can't afford a big exorbitant pastor, someone that needs an interim person to work. And the good thing is the Lord's blessed Nancy and I because I have a very good job at FMC that makes my living for me. But my true living, my real job is standing here. That's what I do. And, you know, and I don't care whether I get paid for it or not. Isn't that something? Isn't that the way it's supposed to be? You know, when the Lord calls you, you have to get there for that calling. You know what I'm saying? You have to be part of that. So my message today, well, you know, it's about an hour and a half. How long do y'all usually take? Y'all are ready, 15, 20 minutes? 15, Robbie's a 15. Anybody over here give me better than a 15? Anybody better on 15? There's Jerry, five Jerry. Jerry's got a five, okay. So we're good. We had a little auction there and... Uh, so, you know, you guys just going to have to be bored for a little bit. I'm one of those speakers that, you know, I start out. The other thing is, is, you know, I feel tied down. You know, I'm a rover. So forgive me if I walk away from the mic here, but that's just kind of the way I am. My message today is going to come out of Romans, and it's going to be out of chapter 1. And you're going to say, well, this is a, kind of an interesting place, Romans chapter 1. I'm going to read two verses in Romans chapter 1. Two verses, and I'm going to read 16, 17 as my main part of the message. I'll eventually get around to 18, but those are the first two verses I'm going to do. But before I do that, as I usually do, I build up before we actually get there. So hold your finger there if you have a Bible. Everybody bring their Bible. Guys, where's your Bibles? Bring your Bibles. Do not believe anything a man tells you from here. Brother Earl will tell you the same thing. Joe will tell you the same thing. I'll tell you the same thing. Many men that come to the pulpit that don't believe a word I say, read it for yourself, learn it for yourself, understand it for yourself before you let someone go in and tell you what it's supposed to be. Now, I'll tell you what happened out at Greens Creek. They asked me, and I said, well, here's the deal. I don't mind being your interim. I told Duffo the same thing. But this is the way it is. If you want me to be your interim, you have to be 100% all for. Won't oppose, I won't go. It has to be 100%. That's the way it has to be in your life. It has to be 100%. You have to apply everything you have to what God wants in your life. 
And so my message today is going to talk about that. How do we apply some of this scripture to our life? And at the same time, this is kind of a gospel message. Because, you know, most preachers, they don't like to get away from not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and trying to get someone to come up here to join the church. That's our job. But the problem is many people nowadays walk up the aisles here and join churches that don't have a clue who Jesus Christ is. And that's our failure. That's our problem because we cannot teach people nowadays what's supposed to happen. Turn with me over to Revelations. And I'm going to read in chapter 1. I told you I'd kind of jump around a little bit. Revelations chapter 1. I'm going to read a couple of verses here. Excuse me, Revelations chapter 3. I'm going to read a couple of verses. 15 through 17. And that's talking about the church in Laodicea. And Laodicea was one of those churches that if you're a Bible scholar, as a theologian, you'll find out if you read Revelations and it goes through the churches, this is the last church and it kind of is the churches of today. Okay, so let me read that for you. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tread in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eyesalve, and thou mayest see. You see, here's the churches of today. What they are is they're big, rich churches. They got big bands, big banners, big TV screens, everything you wanted to see. They draw people by the hundreds. But do they preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? It's usually a good news message. If you'll come to church, if you'll put your money, money in this offering plate, you're going to be good. You ever heard that before? Have you ever seen that before? What churches need to be are different. Churches need to be smaller groups of people where we can minister one to another. That's the way churches were originally set up. Not these big roving estates with five or 6,000 people. Rock and roll bands. They're nice. Nancy and I went to a couple. They're fun. Jerry's looking at me back there. He goes, I don't think I'm talking about y'all. One other thing that happens in a ministry is no matter what you say, you're going to step on somebody's toe. Right? So that's just the way it is. So here in Laodicea, what they begin to do is, is they begin to have these big churches and these big things going on, and many, many people were coming. But all the time, God says, you know, when you have all this stuff, but you know, you're a poor church. In fact, you're the poorest church I've ever seen. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten thee. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come unto him and sup with him and he with me. You see, that's the way it's supposed to be is churches are supposed to have a relationship with God. Now you're trying to figure out where is he going with this if I'm over in Romans, aren't you? I'll get you there. Some said no, some say yes. So here's my here's my. Part. I've been studying at Pony Creek. We've been finished up this week, Ecclesiastes. And in Ecclesiastes, it says something. Let me read it for you. It's actually the, uh, if you want to go to Ecclesiastes, you can certainly do that. And uh, we'll read that last part of Ecclesiastes there. It's in chapter 12. And I'd like to read the last two verses for you. I'll eventually get to my real sermon. I just had to build you up there. Okay, just bear with me. Chapter 12, verse 13 says this. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment and every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. See, one of the things the big churches have stopped telling you is that once you walk down this aisle, you're supposed to be like Christ and Christ-like. You cannot live in the world and do all the worldly things and know Christ. 
That's the rub. Many churches have you come and say, all you got to do is believe. All you got to do is come up here and confess your faith in Jesus Christ. And guess what? All the riches of the world, all the immortality will belong to you. But that's not exactly true, is it? Because a lot of people come and they truly don't believe. Now comes my message. Go back to Romans with me. You go back to Romans, that first chapter, and let's read verse 16. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for as the power of God unto salvation, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. The reason they said the Jews first is they're the chosen people, aren't they? First to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. And what he says is, I'm not ashamed of it. Boy, I tell you what, how many people have you noticed in the world today that are ashamed to, where do you go to church? Well, I go to church. People ought to really be proud of where they're going. If they go to a godly church, a Christ-driven church, they ought to be speaking the words. But a lot of people don't do that, do they? They try to hide. You get in the worldly way and it's kind of embarrassing when everybody that you work with You're ashamed to say where you went to church. You ever noticed it? But that's the way of the world, isn't it? And what it says in the Bible, we know that Scripture says it's going to wax worse and worse and worse and worse, and it's going to just keep going. People that tell you that things are getting better, I wouldn't exactly believe it because the Bible I read out of says that things are really going to get pretty poor before it's over with. And some churches are already headed down that line. You can certainly read in Revelations all the seven churches and you can see something different in every one of them that could affect us today. Churches that we see today. But we also know that these churches, while they're changing and their evolution is going and going and going, we know that they're getting further and further away from Christ and getting closer and closer to the world. Verse 17, Romans. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. From faith to faith it is written, The just shall live by faith. Now that's kind of an interesting point is because what happens is many churches say all you've got to have is a faith or a knowledge of Jesus Christ and you've got the whole world before you. But you see, there's a problem with that. Because you see, most people don't live with faith. They say they have faith, but they depend on themselves most of the time. What they do is, is they want to live their own life, live the worldly life, and then go to church on Sunday and hide. It's one of those things that happens. If you look in Matthew, if you were to read in Matthew chapter 24, you would find the faithfulness of people. I'm not going to go there and read it, make you read it tonight. If you go to Luke chapter 7, you would talk about the absolute trust of faith. You see, faith has a lot of meanings to a lot of people, doesn't it? We learned at an early age. If you put your finger in the fire, this is about the third time I use this today. If you put your finger in the fire, you're going to get burned. I have faith in that knowledge. I know if I put my finger in there, I'm going to get burned. You see, faith in God is telling you the same thing because God expects you to live according to what the Scripture said. And if you don't, you put your finger in the fire, guess what? You're going to get burned. And i.e. the fallacy of many churches today because they have led people to believe that you can come to Christ And you don't have to change anything in your life. You can live as sinful as you want to, do the things you want to, get away with what you want to, and it's okay because you're saved now. That's not exactly true, is it? Because the Bible, I says, said, you know what Christ said? He said, sin no more at every chance he get, didn't he? says, you now know, sin no more. Wow. 
That's kind of scary, isn't it? But what churches have led you to believe is that you can get away with murder. You can do whatever you want to do in the world, and you can go back to church on Sunday, hide in the pews, and it's okay. And preachers say, well, you know, all you have to do is come up here, put a little money up there, and it'll be all right. Hebrews, if you lift, read chapter 11, verse 1, it says you would have a confident hope, which is faithful, confident hope. But if you're reading James, it begins to talk about a barren belief. And that's the way some churches are, aren't they? We come in, we have no love for each other at all. What happens is we're the first ones to throw someone under the bus. First ones to let them starve to death, aren't we? As long as you don't bother me and mine, I don't care what you do. See, that's the way we've got, isn't it? You see, but as Christians, we're supposed to band together. We're supposed to be all one like, together, equals. And if someone falls astray, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to pick that person up, that brother, that sister up. And we're supposed to help them. And why do we want to do that? Because we're no better. Man, I have my own baggage. I have many, many problems. I have kid problems. I have other problems. Money problems. Job problems. Don't we all? But is that any reason to quit? Because, you see, that's what so many people have done is they've quit those things. They go to church on Sunday. They sit on the pews on Sunday. They listen to the preacher on Sunday. And then at the end of the day, nothing's changed. So it says here, it is written, the just shall live by faith. What does the just mean? The faithful. The righteous. That's the just that Paul's talking about here. By faith. And here's the faith. The faith is, is if I do something wrong against what the word of God said, I'm going to get punished for it. Now you're going to go, well, that's not exactly true, is it? But as Christians, we were the first ones to say, hey, what'd you do in your life? Kind of like Job. What did you do? Let me throw you under the bus. You must have done something in your life to have to have this happen to you. It's part of living, though, isn't it? But the thing is, we're supposed to walk the narrow path. The gate is very narrow. And it's hard to get through. But we want everybody there, don't we? So if you look in the Old Testament, you get this same thing. From faith to faith, this has been revealed. It, the just shall live by faith. Turn back with me to Hibaka. It's like tobacco. Chapter 1, verse 3. said verse 1 chapter 3 it's verse 2 chapter 4 chapter 2 verse 4 I'll get there excuse me this is what this prophet says says behold his soul which is lifted up not upright in him but the just shall live by faith Paul says from faith to faith what he meant from faith to faith is from the Old Testament to the New Testament you live by faith. That's what he's saying. That's why he said what he did. There's others. Hebrew 10.38. Galatians 3.11. You live. The just shall live by faith. What is the faith you have? The faith in this infallible word of God? In every word that's written here? I do. Do you? So what did Paul mean by saying, the just shall live by faith? Well, you have to be very careful and understand faith, don't we? You can see some people now have turned faith into works. And the works is, is all you have to do is come down here and have faith and say you believe in Jesus Christ, let me say a prayer over you, and therefore you are now justified. That's not exactly the way it works, is it? 
What happens is you have to generally have faith to be justified. Do you have faith? Do you know that if you do something wrong that you're going to get your fingers burned? That's what my Bible says. The other thing is, is we don't even teach our children that, do we? If you turn back to Job chapter 1, verse 3, that's where I should have gone. I wrote down the wrong thing. It says, tell your children of it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation. You see, what's happened is the reason the church is beginning to fall away is what's happening is, is people aren't telling their children, are they? Nobody ch- tells their children. Somewhere in the Bible, you can quote it, it says, raise up your children. Anybody know that verse? Raise up your children in the way of the Lord. What will happen? They'll return. Yeah, they'll drift away a little bit, but guess what? They come back. Most of the people in this room I knew a long time ago. My kids were no different than the kids that were (coughs) raised here. Drifted away for a while, but they always come back. But you see, if you don't tell them, if you don't see, if you don't tell, what's going to happen is the world is going to get worse and worse. People are going to fall away. They're going to think that, you know, just because I went to church and I walked down this aisle and I was dunked in this baptismal thing, that I now am saved. But I believe this. I believe we've told an unconditional lie to most people from the pulpit. Because we told them, if you do that, you're okay. And that's scary. As a preacher... For Brother Earl, for Joe, myself, for others that I've known. Heaven forbid that I tell something and let them get away with something that will cause their demise. It's scary, isn't it, Joe? Because the thing is, we want the best for people. But you can't come down this aisle professing your faith and then tomorrow morning go out and do all the other ugly things you did in the world. And it happens all the time. You ever notice that? And it's okay. Because you see, most people say, I have faith, but they don't have any faith at all. So the just shall live by faith. The other thing is we say that faith now is a works. That if you'll come in and have faith, you'll work your way into heaven because all you got to do is now believe. But that's not what the scripture says. The scripture says that faith... Is not by works. Galatians 2.16. Let's turn back there and see what Galatians 2.16 says. Am I going past my minutes? Hey, y'all can laugh. I laugh. I have a good time myself. Galatians 2.16. Knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, not by the works of the law. For the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But you see, churches are teaching works through faith to be justified. It's a subtle thing. You watch TV preachers? They're the best at it. All you got to do is read my book. And you know what? You'll have heaven will come to you. It'll be a great day for the Lord because he wants the best for you. Heaven forbid that I send anybody down the path of hell. There's a big abyss out there. And if I don't hold people back, I'm going to pay for it one of these days. I'm going to be held accountable for it, me personally. There's a big book, and we're all going to be judged out of the book. And in the book, it's going to have my name. And by my name is, said, do you know what you've done? Do you know how many people you sent to hell? And I believe there's a real place of hell. Do you? I know this church does. I've been here before. Sure, there's a hell. And the thing is, if we don't keep people out of hell, 
We haven't been doing our job, have we? But big churches, they like to say, oh, you know, it's not no real place anyway. It's in a figment of your imagination. All you got to do is believe, and you can do whatever you want to do, and you're all right. And that's the way most people do. Six days a week, they live like they're going to hell. And on Sunday, they try to always go back and fix it in one day, right? And you can be forgiven for your sins. But I'm telling you this right now. If you're living a sinful nature right now, you better go back and ask yourself, do I really know the Jesus Christ that's in this Bible? Do am I really justified my faith with the knowledge of Jesus Christ? Or is this just a bunch of words I'm speaking? Make it look good. Because I can go to church, and you know, if I go to a big church, maybe what I can do is I can pick up some business opportunities. And it looks good on paper, right? I'm not making fun of any churches. I've been to the Cowboy Church. I've been to Rocky Point. I've been to First Baptist. I've, been, I've seen them all. And it's nice to have those big churches, and I'm not saying they're wrong. But it's just when you go, and you begin to see the people, you realize something's not exactly right, don't you? Because they all say, yeah, I go to XYZ church. And you go, and you live the way you're living? You're just going to church. Because you're not reading the same Bible I read. Because you're not supposed to be doing that. Can you be forgiven of it? Absolutely you can. Grace is a great gift. The only way we all got here where we're at today is through God's grace, isn't it? But the thing is, is let's not take grace and use it wastefully. If we're going to take God's grace, that free gift of eternal life, we ought to take it and grasp hold of it and love it and cherish it and do nothing to destroy it. But a lot of people do, don't they? And you go, did they really get the same grace I got? And I'm not passing judgment. I told uh, someone this morning at Pony Creek, I said, you know, if you're expecting me to ever preach a funeral and me tell you that your loved one has gone to heaven, you're not going to hear it out of these lips. It's not going to happen. The reason is I don't know any person in this room. None. I don't know your walk with Christ. I don't know anything about you only God does I'm not your judge I'm not going to judge and I'm not going to let somebody know hey this person's going to heaven I don't know that I don't know who's going to go and who's going to be not what I hear a preacher say one time I'm going to get to heaven a lot of people are going to be surprised I'm there but I'm going to be surprised other people are there right that's the way it's going to work so we don't really know we just know that what we're supposed to do is, is we're supposed to take people that we know, lead them to Christ, teach them what God has set before them, and that's our job. If they don't take it, I can't help it. But I'm certainly not going to say you can come to church every Sunday and go live like the Dickens during the week, because that's wrong. Ephesians 2.8. Everybody ought to be able to quote this from heart. Can you? Ephesians 2.8. 2, 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. You see that works that the people keep trying to put on it? All you have to do is believe. That's not it. it is. It's all about God. He's the only one that can give that gift. No one else. No preacher, nobody, Sunday school person, nothing. You can't even give it to yourself. But that's what's happening. Many people try to give the gift of grace to themselves. They walk down the aisle and they say, yeah, I believe. So now I have grace. But grace is one of those things that shows in a person's life, isn't it? Because you have to live according to the gospel of what's set up here by the laws. And if you're not doing that, you don't have that grace. Think you do, but you may not. And I'm not your judge. 
You have to be the judge yourself. You have to decide whether you have that grace or not. That's not for me to say. I'm just saying I'd be very careful if I'm living away from what these words are saying, I would be careful as to say I have grace. In fact, I'd be careful to say I actually know Jesus Christ. I don't think God likes to be uh, tormented, tortured, or prodded at. Because he might bite you. So as I close this message today, the only thing I want you to learn is this. Don't listen to what the world tells you. Listen to what God tells you. If you want to know what God's going to tell you, read your Bible. And I know it's hard. I'll pick on you for just a minute, and I don't mean to. When I was younger, I didn't carry a Bible either to church. But you ought to carry a Bible. You ought to let people know that you got a Bible. And you ought to read it every day. You want God to talk to you? Because the day that a God talked to me, there wasn't a big booming voice that says, Hey, I want you to be a preacher. He didn't say that. I read it right here. I knew what I was supposed to do after I read the words. After you read your Bible, the second thing is you need to pray. And if you're not praying, maybe you don't have that grace. Because if you don't have a good, strong prayer life, you're probably not right with God. The other thing you ought to do is listen to what people say. And I know it's real easy to come to church or Wednesday night or, or Sunday evenings or whatever it is and have someone boring like me speak to you. But here's the thing is, if you want to hear what God has to say to you, listen to what the man in the pulpit says. Listen to what your Sunday school class says. Listen to what the words of the hymns say. God will speak to you. Read your Bible, pray, listen. Final thing is this. One of the best resources of all that you want God to speak to you, listen to your Christian friends. Because they'll tell you something and you'll go, that's from God. <laughs> I know where that came from. Read your Bible. Pray. Listen to the man that preaches, teaches. Listen to your friends. That interaction, that's what you do to get that interaction. It's one of the things I had the hardest time learning when I was a young person. I don't need to read my Bible. Pray. Yeah. Oh, you've all done it. Don't, don't say, look at him. He's a... I know you've all done it. Go ahead and say you didn't. I want you to. Yeah, you're not going to do it, are you? So as you go through and you begin to look at this message, it comes down to this final thing, this gift of grace. To be justified in Christ, you have to utilize your faith. You have to take the faith with open arms and use every bit of it. Because here's the final verse. Chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Do you hold the truth? Do you have God's grace? Can you walk away this evening with your head up high, praying to God, knowing that you have a place to go, a place of immortality? Heaven's supposed to be a great place, I'm told. It's just something I've read. But you know what? I have faith that it's there, as well as I have a faith that there's a hell. And what I want for everybody here is to get God's grace and use God's grace. And if anybody here doesn't do these things, then maybe you ought to rethink who you are, what you're doing, where you're going. 
because it's a short, short road, isn't it? That Ecclesiastes we study, that it's Pony Creek. Life is short. It's the vanities of vanities. It's the meaningless of meaningless. And it's very short-lived, isn't it? When I first car come here, Charlie was about 10. I well, maybe he was a little older. <laughs> when Nancy and I started coming, we were 10. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I think, uh, you know, it's been a very much a uh, privilege of mine to be here. I always like to come, come by. And, uh, you know, if church ever needs someone to fill in, they got Joe. But I wouldn't mind coming back at all. So let's close in a word of prayer. Is that the way you do it? Say close. Let me close in a word of prayer if you don't mind.